The story unfolds in the secret forest, cloaked in obscurity, with the atmosphere permeated by the redolence of time-worn trees and moist soil. Ning Yu and Lin Feng stood on either side of Su Yun Lan, who struggled to keep up with their pace. Ning Yu, a beautiful and cunning young woman, is engaged to Su Yun Lan, the adopted son of the Demon King's family. However, Ning Yu had no love for him and was instead infatuated with Ling Feng a typical retainer involved in their political engagement. Su Yun Lan is adopted by the Demon King out of nowhere, and Ning Yu can't understand why her father had chosen Su Yun Lan over him. They continued their journey, and Ning Yu bantered Su Yun Lan, a good-for-nothing loser. Lin Feng glanced at Su Yun Lan and shook his head, having questions about what Ning Yu's father was thinking when picking Su Yu Lan as her fiancé. Ning Yu just laughs it off and brags about how lucky Su Yun Lan is to be with her. Lin Feng couldn't help thinking about Su Yun Lan's past. He had been a typical retainer to the Demon King's family. Su Yun Lan remained silent as the two talked. He had always known that he was seen as a loser by Ning Yu. However, he couldn't help how he felt about her and would do anything to protect her. Ning Yu suddenly turned to Lin Feng with a mischievous glint in her eyes, telling him she had no idea what her dear father was thinking either. She promised Lin Feng that her heart always belonged to him. Lin Feng raised an eyebrow in surprise. He had never expected Ning Yu to make a move on him so blatantly. Ning Yu placed her hand on Ling Feng's chest, and he reciprocated by telling her he wasn't worried about it and would man up to her father once his trial was finished. It's his way of trying to be diplomatic. Ning Yu's expression turned sour. A sudden idea occurred to her, suggesting taking care of Su Yu Lan while they were alone and with no witnesses, gesturing to finish Su Yun Lan's life right here. Lin Feng's eyes widened in shock, telling her to be careful as he is still the king's adopted son despite his weak form. As they continued walking, a rustling sound interrupted their conversation. Something or someone seemed to be hunting them. Su Yun Lan's instincts kicked in as he saw the demon approaching, pushing Ning Yu out of the way. Lin Feng springs into action, drawing his sword and preparing to fight as Su Yun Lan has his back to the ground while the demon is on top of him. Ning Yu watched in horror as Su Yu Lan desperately cried for help fighting for his life. The demon on top of him is about to get the taste of Lin Feng's blade. Despite all the chaos, Ning Yu saw an opportunity to end Su Yu Lan, as she suggested to Lin Feng a moment before the demon attacked. She asked Lin Feng for confirmation whether he agreed to what she suggested. This is a perfect chance for them. Lin Feng did not speak a word and continued to charge the demon and raised his sword, setting up to stab with a heavy blow. Lin Feng successfully stabbed the demon on top of Su Yu Lan. As the blade pierced through the creature, Lin Feng's heavy force made the sword get into Su Yu Lan's torso, causing him to bleed. Ning Yu watched with a cruel smile as Lin Feng's sword spurted blood, drenching the ground beneath them. He grabbed Su Yu Lan's head, trying to make him closer as he spoke coldly. Lin Feng told him that if he was going to die today, dying on his blade would be better, as if it was an honor, and in the end, he managed to finish them both. Su Yu Lan was confused and just blurted why while coughing with blood. She acknowledged Lin Feng commending him for being decisive. Lin Feng withdrew his sword, leaving Su Yu Lan helpless on the ground, drenched in his blood. Lin Feng reassures Su Yu Lan that he will inform his majesty about his tragic end. Ning Yu looked at Su Yun Lan's lifeless body, whispered to herself that she was sure of what she saw. It is dead. Lin Feng and Ning Yu turned and left Su Yun Lan's helpless body to writhe in agony. A man watched the scene with pity, exclaiming how tragic it is for someone born with a body suitable for demonic cultivation but betrayed by his own betrothed and her paramour. He knew all too well what it was like to be betrayed. This is an opportunity for him to borrow Su Yun Lan's body, seek revenge, and rewrite history. The man named Xu and Qiu Chuo did not waste a second of this window of opportunity for him. He feels very motivated as he clenches his fists. Xu and Qiu Chuo vows to blow away the darkness and finish his revenge this time. A bright light flashed, and Xu and Qiu Chuo found himself in his own realm, possessing Su Yun Lan's body. He looked down at his new form, marveling at how different it felt from his old body. Xu and Qiu Chuo, now Su Yun Lan knew that demons only react to alive humans and sudden noise. With Su Yun Lan's particular body, he could avoid being detected as a human. However, he knew he had to be careful and avoid making the same mistake Su Yun Lan did. He remembered the ultimate technique of demonic possession, passed down by an ancient clan called the Nine Circles of Hell. Su Yun Lan had been the last living descendant of this clan, and the technique allowed the user to take over a demon's body. The stronger one's spirit, the stronger the possessive power. Su Yun Lan remarks about the power of demonic possession as he observes a demonstration. He explains that this technique is the ultimate way of possessing a demon using one's spirit. 
A moment later, Lin Fang and Ning Yu are kissing when suddenly Ning Yu notices something unusual. She exclaims in shock, realizing that demons are present. Lin Feng identifies the boss as the demon general. Su Yun Lan appears in front of them, disgusted by their behavior, and threatens them with a death stare. Lin Feng and Ning Yu felt great danger as they watched the demon's presence. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan glares at them menacingly through the demon's eyes. As the battle raged on, Lin Feng fought valiantly against the demons, trying to protect his love, Ning Yu. They found themselves surrounded by a horde of demons. Lin Feng fought bravely, striking down as many demons as he could. But for each one he fell, two more seemed to take its place. Lin Feng was determined to protect Ning Yu, the woman he loved. So he shows off some skills while fighting the demon, hoping to impress her with his bravery. Ning Yu was unimpressed. Instead, in her mind, she belittles him. Finally, Lin Feng realized that they were outnumbered and outmatched. He is determined to find a way out. But just as they were about to flee, something unexpected occurred. Lin Feng felt a sharp pain as Ning Yu pierced his back with a knife, causing the demon to divert the attack to Lin Feng to protect herself. Lin Feng could not believe Ning Yu had done that to him. He coughed up so much blood and was about to ask why she did that when Ning Yu interrupted him. Ning Yu then insulted him as a slow, dimwit man, with a hint of disdain in her voice. Desperately, Lin Feng turned to Ning Yu as he pleaded his feelings while in a dire time. Ning Yu smiled, and her disdainful gaze made him feel small and insignificant. Ning Yu suggests that he offers his blood to the demons as if his life is worth nothing to her. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan watched from a distance, his face unreadable, wondering how she got away and just brushed it off as if it won't matter, as everyone had their turn in the end. Su Yun Lan looked around, trying to determine what had caused the disturbance. Suddenly, he heard a woman's voice and the unmistakable noise of a horse. A woman on a magnificent stallion was galloping toward the demon. She had a sword in her hand and slashed through the air with incredible speed and precision. As he stood there watching her plunged into the battle, stabbing at the demons with ferocious fury. Her abilities impressed Su Yun Lan, and wondering why she was using so much power merely to rescue his body. While he glanced in the distance at the woman, he heard her voice again. Su Yun Lan grasps the demon's body weakened with a groan. He disengaged and collapsed to the ground as he cast a spell before him, feeling weak and helpless. The moon shines brightly in the gloomy night as the chilly wind blows. A young lady having a hot bath while chatting with her pet is perplexed as to why the gentleman she saves is surrounded by demons. At this moment, Su Yun Lan couldn't believe his luck as none of them seemed to notice him. His thoughts raced as he tried to piece together what had happened to him. Su Yun Lan slowly regained consciousness, but before he could fully comprehend the situation, a woman's voice interrupted his thoughts, catching him off guard. Su Yun Lan, who had fainted, wondered what had happened. He is suddenly surprised to find himself transformed into a squirrel. The woman is unaware that her pet's spirit got invaded by the Su Yun Lan spirit as she teases his pet who is not fond of water. Su Yun Lan felt disbelief in his perspective when he saw a lady's bathhouse with a nude woman alongside him, and later realized that he must have messed up the technique and ended up as her pet squirrel. As the woman slipped into her clothes, she said they checked on the man's body. He felt waggles on his body while seeing the woman change her clothes. Su Yun Lan's thoughts raced as he realized that the body they would feel was his own, and he needed to touch it to get back into it. He quickly dives to contact his body as they get close to it and regains full consciousness. Su Yun Lan made it a success. Finally, he was back in his body, confirming that his stomach wound had been treated and bandaged. As they are the only two people in the wilderness, Su Yun Lan believes this woman is the only one who treated his wound and saved his life. However, he doubted this woman seemed distant and to be concealing something, yet he felt something odd about her. Su Yun Lan knew he had to be going, but before he could, the woman mumbled something about looking for the fabled sword. As the woman tries to leave without saying a word, Su Yun Lan stops her and offers to guide her to the Sword of Legend as a token of gratitude for saving his life. As they approach the sword's location, the woman offers to climb since Su Yun Lan is injured. The woman steps forward and jumps so high that she pulls the sword out of the tree. She is surprised that it is the star splitter she's been looking for, a mighty weapon. After she landed on the ground, she asked the man why she knew the location of the sword. Su Yun Lan reveals that he knew of the sword's location as he chanced upon it and silently thanked the sacred scroll. In gratitude for the woman saving his life, Su Yun Lan offers her the sword as a gift. The woman is surprised that such an important sword is now hers. Then the woman introduced her name, Yuan Ying of the Xuan clan tossed the jade tassel to him and assured him to help him. Su Yun Lan remembered her name and whispered it to himself, Yuan Ying. A group of people waiting outside of the spirit world exit as they anticipate the arrival of someone. 
One exclaims that someone is coming out, and the other asks who it is. Another one recognizes the person as the princess, and is excited to see her return. The fourth one points out that the princess has found the sword and is indeed the strongest of her generation. They all gather around and notice there is someone else behind the princess. A man recognizes him as Su Yun Lan. The man that recognizes is revealed to be the demon lord's eldest adopted son, Qiu Yixuan. However, some people insult and mock Su Yun Lan, calling him a loser adopted by their family. Qiu Yixuan responds by saying that he couldn't even die quietly, showing his resentment towards his adoptive family. Ning Yur, who appears distressed, begins to cry and lament the loss of her loved one, Lin Feng. She then turns her attention to Su Yun Lan, calling him an opportunistic coward who abandoned her and left to die. Yuan Ying tries to defend Su Yun Lan by asking him to clear up the misunderstanding, but he refuses and insults them. In his mind, Su Yun Lan thinks about how manipulative Ning Yuer can be and how she could talk the Grim Reaper himself into giving her extra time. Cao Yik Shuan then punches Su Yun Lan, letting a fight break out. Su Yun Lan thinks that if he fights back, he will give himself away as he tries to keep his identity a secret. Qiu Yixuan puts a cape around Ning Yu's shoulders and assures her they will not let Su Yun Lan's dishonorable behavior pass. He promised that the cowardice would be met with firm punishment. The people around them are impressed with Qiu Yixuan's response. Even someone stated that he seems like an intelligent and responsible young man. However, Yuan Ying calls Qiu Yixuan a hypocrite, suggesting she may know more about the situation than she lets on. Qiu Yixuan ordered his guards to apprehend Su Yun Lan and the group began to disperse. A moment later, Ning Yuer is suspicious of Su Yun Lan, making her think he might know too much. However, she kept the thought to herself. The first rays of daylight began to peek over the horizon. Su Yun Lan walked down the streets and was lost in his thoughts. It was dangerous being Su Yun Lan in this world. He had nearly died twice since arriving here, but he had to remain on his mission, a purpose that he was determined to fulfill. He thought back to his previous lives, and memories of his past flashed before his eyes. In his first life, he had been the proud son of the Xuan clan, the most substantial family of cultivators in the kingdom, but they had been framed and brought down by the so-called disciples of the righteous path. They killed him coldly and forced his father to become their demon king. In his second life, he was a scientist of the 21st century. He studied natural laws and scientific philosophy, but it did not bring him any closer to taking revenge for his bloody end. And now, in his third life, he had returned to his birth world as his father's adopted son. He had become Su Yun Lan, a retainer family's son adopted by the sect leader. But not everyone was happy about his return. Even his family members looked down on him, seeing him as a lowly nobody who should disappear. Su Yun Lan had a plan. He was determined to turn this wretched world on its head. He knew that everything rode on having power, money, and even political backing. And that's where the Heavenly Scroll came in. It was a powerful tool that could make him rich beyond his wildest dreams. He prayed to the scroll to make him prosperous. He whispered to himself, holding onto the scroll tightly. Somewhere else, a man and a woman are engaged in a game of odds and evens. The man is frustrated and loses a round to the woman, who taunts him with a laugh. Right then, a stranger came in. Su Yun Lan whispered a set of numbers to the man and bet on the odds. The man is surprised and irritably asks who he is. The woman interrupts, asking the man whether he is scared to keep playing. The man takes offense and follows the stranger's bet on the odds. The woman announces her bet on three, three, or five odds, which the man wins in the game. However, the stranger whispers to the man again, advising him to bet on evens for the next round. The man followed the stranger's advice and won the next round with evens. The stranger then whispers another set of numbers for the next round, which the man follows and wins again. The woman becomes suspicious of the man's winning streak and accuses Su Yun Lan of cheating. The stranger challenges her to prove her allegations. As the tension rises, the man reveals his identity as a nobleman and throws his royal crest, indicating his power and influence. The woman and others in the establishment immediately kneel in respect. Then, Su Yun Lan introduces himself and offers his service to the noble. The noble, pleased with Su Yun Lan's assistance, thanks him and asks him to rise. Su Yun Lan also expressed his gratitude. Meanwhile, the manager appeared in the establishment. He them by apologizing and welcoming them to the establishment. He then introduces his name, Chang Huo. The nobleman recognizes Chang Huo's dragon ring and realizes he is a retainer of his older brother. Chang Huo offers to report any issues directly to his lord, the second prince. However, in his mind, he thinks of the nobleman as a good-for-nothing spoiled kid who won't amount to anything. 
The nobleman is taken aback by Chang Huo's words and seems hesitant. Then the nobleman sighs and tells Su Yun Lan to leave and return the winnings. But Su Yun Lan intervenes, saying he will handle the unpleasantness. Su Yun Lan then insults the manager, Chang Huo, calling him derogatory and smacking him. This causes a commotion. The people around them are surprised. Chang Huo tells his men to get Su Yun Lan, but he stops them, interrupting the manager that he is looking out for him. Su Yun Lan then tells Chang Huo that he disrespects his grace and that there is a death penalty for disrespecting royalty. Chang Huo panics, and Su Yun Lan continues to insult him. The nobleman seems amused by the situation, thinking Chang Huo is a dumb man. Su Yun Lan humiliates Chang Huo further by giving him a dog bowl, reminding him where he belongs. Chang Huo is furious and vows to get back at them. The nobleman tells Su Yun Lan to leave, and they eat at the Immortality Pavilion. Chang Huo is left fuming and smashes a plate in his hands, feeling an incredible frustration. He then tells his guard to find out who Su Yun Lan is as he vows to get his revenge. Later in an inn, two men discuss their lodgings. The nobleman is complaining that they could only book second-rate rooms due to booking at the last minute. Su Yun Lan responds to the complaints with annoyance, thinking that their room is actually a presidential suite. As they are talking, the nobleman introduces himself as Lai Tan, the youngest son of the current emperor. He boasts about his ability to get them into any place in the capital for entertainment, and Su Yun Lan notes that he seems proud of himself. He also observes that there is a vast difference in character between Lai Tang and his sister. Su Yun Lan introduces himself as the second adopted son of the Demon King. Lai Tang is amazed to hear that Su Yun Lan is the second son of the Demon King and thinks that they must have been fated to meet. He jokes that a loser son like Su Yun Lan and a good-for-nothing prince like himself make a great pair. Su Yun Lan jokes about their conversation sounding a little inappropriate, which confuses Lai Tang. He asks for clarification, and Su Yun Lan responds that it means close friends. Lai Tang asks Su Yun Lan for his opinion on the gambling game they just played and compliments him, calling him a betting god. However, Lai Tang is not satisfied and shows disappointment in the quality of the alcohol. He slams his cup on the table before deciding to find better alcohol. Su Yun Lan thinks Lai Tang needs to watch his mouth since he is only 13 or 14. As Lai Tang leaves the room, Su Yun Lan hears a squirrel outside the window and realizes that his possession technique works on small animals too. He engages in the Nine Circles clan possession technique and possesses the squirrel, causing his body to fall at his feet. He realizes that it has worked and feels pleased with himself. Suddenly, he jumps out of the room to get on top of the tree and slips, which startles Su Yun Lan. He is relieved to have not fallen and thinks that he needs some time to adjust to his new body. Meanwhile, he also saw Ning Yuer with his grandfather in the inn, and hears the conversation with his grandfather by asking why she needs to marry Su Yun Lan. Su Yun Lan thinks that he suspects Yuer of being a fraud and wonders what new trick she's planning. Ding Yuer's grandfather explains that the engagement is an alliance between their clan and the Demon King. He reveals that Su Yun Lan has a rare property in his blood, which makes him invisible to demons. Ning Yuer is surprised to hear this and remembers how he survived a sea of monsters without a scratch. However, Ning Yuer points out that Su Yun Lan cannot use cultivation techniques and is no better than a commoner. Her grandfather explains that the gods granted him this blood, a waste, except for their clan's traditional mantis spider blood art. He explains that the technique, when performed together by a man and a woman, this technique will steal the man's blood and spirit. Ning Yuer's grandfather convinces her that with Su Yun Lan's blood, she can become a cultivation prodigy and be immune to demons. Ning Yuer seems excited about becoming an unmatched genius and asks if they will suck out Su Yun Lan's blood and leave him to die. Her grandfather confirms this and reveals a bottle of poison from the venom of thousands of insects that completely disintegrates a person's insides causing an agonizing death. Su Yun Lan thinks it's disgraceful that such a prestigious noble family is plotting against him underhandedly. Su Yun Lan recognizes the poison is the same one that killed him, and he thinks that the Yongwei clan must have been involved in his premature death. He stared angrily at the two people inside the room from the outside while leaning against the tree. Ning Yuer and his grandfather didn't realize that someone was watching them. Afterward, Su Yun Lan's body now possesses his own. The sound of leaves floating can be heard in the background. While pondering about the Yongwei clan being one of the culprits he was after, he wonders if they have more sordid secrets. He is in a precarious situation with enemies approaching him from all sides. His fiancée's family wants him dead, and he cannot face his father now. Su Yun Lan realizes that if he cannot get out of this arranged marriage, he will surely be dead. Just then, his friend Lai Tang offers him a place to stay. 
Su Yunlan thinks this is just what he hoped for. The wind blowing can be heard as he makes his way to Lai Tang's place. He comments on how luxurious Lai Tang's home is, with the area for entertaining guests taking up a whole courtyard. He also notes that the prince's mansion is built next to the princesses, which he thinks might be a stroke of good fortune. As Su Yun Lan is exploring Lai Tang's place, he notices a squirrel and realizes it is the princess's pet squirrel, then wonders if it came from the princess's mansion. Su Yun Lan calls the squirrel and hugs it. Su Yun Lan then uses the Nine Circles Possession Technique to transform it into a squirrel. He exclaims that he is coming for his princess and thinks that maybe he'll get lucky today with another beautiful view. When Su Yun Lan successfully lands in squirrel form, he already understands how to use his body form. Su Yun Lan realized he had run into the room as he looked around. He was taken aback by the size and how spacious the room was. Then he noticed someone was taking a bath in the tub and jumped straight up to see the naked body of the woman who had no idea of his presence. He was so flustered by what he saw that it made his nose bleed. He spotted the naked woman in the tub just in his mind. The woman then stated that her pet squirrel had not brought a towel with her. Su Yun Lan wonders why every time they encounter it always seems like an AV episode. On the other hand, Yuan Ying appears to have shifted her posture in the tub to expose some flesh on her legs in front of her pet squirrel. That's when Su Yun Lan's thought nosebleed doesn't end. Su Yun Lan is numbing himself to relieve his suffering and control all his focus and the body. Then Yuan Ying suggested that she use the squirrel's body as a towel to dry herself off because the squirrel didn't bring her a towel. That's when Su Yun Lan curses while flees away from the bathhouse. He calmed down again and whispered that he was alive in the 21st century and uncensored hentai thing was nothing. The realization of being single for three lifetimes came in. He is making an excuse that his current circumstance is riskier than using his possessing technique. As if his spirit is going to depart from his body. Su Yun Lan looked around the room, trying to get his bearings. He had been so busy running away that he hadn't been paying attention to where he was going. But now that he had stopped to catch his breath, he realized he was in a grand chamber filled with ornate furnishings and expensive decorations. As he looked around, his eyes fell upon a table in the center of the room, and on that table was a letter. It was addressed to a cousin, Her Highness, and it looked like it had already been opened. He quickly grabbed the letter and began to read it. The letter was from the Garrison General, reporting that everything seemed business as usual for the last few months. However, the second prince showed distrust and formed his own faction. And to make matters worse, the recent training exercise had been an excuse to bully the troops. The letter pleaded with Her Highness to marry and produce an heir, hoping it would bring peace to the troops. It was signed with a message of loyalty, a hope that once the head of state recovered from his illness, Her Highness would take the throne. Su Yun Lan's mind raced as he read the letter. The princess won the heart of the soldiers pledging their loyalty as they asked her to bear an heir. This meant she had ambitions to rule over the kingdom and become the empress. But Su Yun Lan wasn't interested in the throne. He had his own agenda, revenge against those who had wronged him, a personal mission he cannot set aside. This also looks like an opportunity for the princess' ambition. He could use her power to exact his revenge if he could marry her and help her take the throne. Meanwhile, Lai Tang was looking for her sister, asking the maids about his sister's whereabouts. The maid assured him she would tell his sister he was looking for her. At the same time, Su Yun Lan noticed Lai Tang's presence and decided to return to his own body. Lai Tang continued to wait for his sister, and he noticed the squirrel heading toward his mansion. Confused, he followed it with his gaze, but Yuan Ying had already exited the room. Yuan Ying asked him if he had seen his pet squirrel, and Lai Tang informed her that her pet was heading toward his mansion. Yuan Ying, frustrated with the pet's behavior, wanted to give her a piece of her mind. However, Lai Tang interrupted her and excitedly told her to meet a mysterious man he had just met, Su Yun Lan. Then the strong winds began to howl in the yard. Su Yun Lan thought possessing the pet squirrel's body might cause him bad luck. Unaware of the situation, Lai Tang was excited and enthusiastic about introducing his sister to Su Yun Lan. It turned out that Yuan Ying and Su Yun Lan had met in the secret forest, where he had helped her find the Sword of Legend. Lai Tang was impressed by his new acquaintance's heroism and thought he was excellent. Then Lai Tang invites Su Yun Lan inside the palace. Yuan Ying wondered if Su Yun Lan could be a spy sent by the second or seventh prince. She couldn't shake off the coincidence of meeting him twice and was suspicious of his motives. Inside the palace walls, a maid pouring hot tea into a porcelain cup echoed through the air. The graceful and elegant princess, Yuan Ying, looked up from her cup and spoke to Su Yun Lan, inviting him to a tea ceremony she hosted in her backyard the next day. 
She hoped that Su Yun Lan could attend, but it wasn't just any ordinary tea ceremony. Yuan Ying was expecting all the talented men who had gathered to challenge the secret forest to attend as well. Su Yun Lan was intrigued by the idea of the tea ceremony and decided to attend it. He assured Yuan Ying that he would move mountains to make it happen. As Su Yun Lan spoke those words, his thoughts were already racing. As the guests arrived at the princess's residence, the host announced their arrival one by one. The second prince and the seventh prince entered and were followed by Xu and Qiu Yi who is the demon clan heir, and Ning Yur who is from the Yangui sect. Wai Sheng and Hua Wenyu from the Lai and Hua families respectively also made their way into the banquet hall. Xu and Qiu Yi's attention was immediately drawn towards Su Yun Lan. Su Yun Lan was sitting next to the youngest prince. In the meantime, Ning Yur recognized Su Yun Lan. She is wondering why he was present at the gathering. Qiu Yi in an irritable mood grabbed Su Yun Lan by the shirt. He called him a waste of space and demanded that he get down from his seat. Wai Tang intervened and asked Qiu Yi to let go of his guest Su Yun Lan. The second prince stops Qiu Yi and reminded him that they were not in a demon clan meeting room and that he should be mindful of decorum. Qiu Yi finally let go of Su Yun Lan and took walk away, as the second prince willed it. Su Yun Lan thanks the second prince whilst comparing him in his thoughts to how Lai Tang seemed to be very young. The second prince got interested and was piqued at the sight of Su Yun Lan. The ceremony then began, and Yuan Ying spoke to the group. She is explaining that they had been called together to discuss a difficult but vital topic, how to feed their people. Yuan Ying continued, explaining that the population was growing rapidly, and their resources were dwindling. It was clear that they needed to find a solution as soon as they can to ensure that no one will be hungry. Su Yun Lan realized that Yuan Ying was referring to the large drought in the northwest. Huey suggested that increasing grain production and distributing noble lands to farmers could solve the problem. An old person praised Qiyi's idea, much to Su Yun Lan's suspicion. He knew that Qiyi worked for the seventh prince, who had asked him to present the idea as his own. Yuan Ying called out to Lai Tang and responded right away with a sarcastic remark and criticized Qiyi's suggestion, causing confusion among the others present. Lai Tang becomes irritated. He pointed out that the eldest princess had mentioned that and acknowledged the importance of the matter. Lai Tang knew that simply donating food would not solve the problem in the long term. They needed to head the problem off at its source which was the drought itself. He suggests that the immediate course of action should be to send shipments of grain to the northwest to feed the drought victims. Kiwi, who is present there, thinks to himself about how unexpected it was for the Playboy Prince to come up with such a thoughtful plan. Lai Tang then addresses his sister, saying that the Northwest drought is a national disaster, and the royal family alone should not be responsible for providing relief. He proposes that they should appeal to all noble clans and sects to work with them in this time of urgent national need. He suggests that donating food alone would be like bailing a leaking boat. He proposes that his sister should send for all their aqueduct engineers to organize them into task forces and send them to the northwest to irrigate the land and end the drought. The crowd and Yuan Ying were impressed by Lai Tang's insightful plan, and Su Yun Lan couldn't help but smirk. Su Yun Lan felt superior and mocked them as ancient people and believed that he had made his first move in the game of chess with Lai Tang as his pawn. Later, Su Yun Lan wakes up feeling refreshed and energized, realizing that he had not slept so well in a long time. He decided to go and find out what Lai Tang had planned for the day. Su Yun Lan approaches a servant and politely asks to be taken to Lai Tang. A servant informed him that Lai Tang had left early that morning to attend the court and had not yet returned. Suddenly, a royal guard barged in, demanding to see the princess. Su Yun Lan started to feel uneasy and worried that something had happened to Lai Tang. Just then, Su Yun Lan notices Ying Ying, a squirrel pet of the princess. He then orders the servant to return to their chores so that he can interact with the squirrel, Ying Ying. He then turned around and calls out to Ying Ying. The squirrel Ying Ying quickly sprang to Su Yun Lan. Su Yun Lan demonstrates the Nine Circles possession technique to Ying Ying, and they engaged in a playful exchange. Su Yun Lan decided to go and see what was going on at the princess's place. He then sets off toward the princess's place. Yuan Ying is shocked to hear that her brother, Lai Tang, has been thrown into royal prison. She questions the imperial officer about what happened, and he reveals that Lai Tang had criticized the court's solutions to the northwestern drought, 
which enraged the emperor. As the conversation continues, Su Yun Lan is observing the scene and realized that Lai Tang is not the type of person to make such statements and suspects that it may be part of court machinations. Yuan Ying is worried about her brother's well-being and decides to go and explain things to their father. Su Yun Lan immediately possesses his body to stop Yuan Ying from making a rash decision. Yuan Ying was curious and has become increasingly suspicious of Su Yun Lan's knowledge of Lai Tang's situation. She then demanded to know how he knew that something had happened to her brother, and questioned him about his intentions and who had sent him in. Su Yun Lan was caught off guard and realized that he didn't have enough time to think of an excuse to explain his presence. He stumbled over his words, trying to come up with a plausible explanation. He told Yuan Ying that he heard from someone that her brother had left for the morning court in high spirits. However, he had seen an imperial officer rushing into Her Highness's estate just now and that had made him assume that something had happened to Lai Tang. Yuan Ying was skeptical but decided to hear him out. Su Yun Lan warned her that rushing in without a plan could only make things worse. She was about to push past Su Yun Lan when he stopped her again and suggested a plan. Su Yun Lan told Yuan Ying that he could free her brother in her place. He was well versed in irrigation systems and knew how to navigate the underground passages, assuring her that he could resolve the matter and asked for something in return. Yuan Ying was hesitant but agreed as she realized that she had no other choice. However, Su Yun Lan has an ulterior motive, and asked Yuan Ying for something in exchange. Meanwhile, Lai Tang was sent to the underground prison, and he was immediately greeted by a group of rowdy prisoners. They jeered and taunted him, making comments about his clothing and how he must be somewhat important. They likened him to a snowflake, fragile and delicate. The royal guards pushed Lai Tang to his cell. Lai Tang couldn't help but feel a wave of fear wash over him as the heavy jail door clicked shut, locking him inside. He let out a sniffle and whispered for his sister's help, hoping she could somehow hear his plea. But the prisoners were quick to pick up on his vulnerability and started teasing him further, mockingly asking him why he is shaking. They boasted about the prison's death row being more interesting than the royal court, and how even Princess Ying would keep them company at night. Lai Tang could feel his anger rising, he could snap at any given moment. In a fit of rage, he started cursing the prisoners and threatening them with violence. He even went so far and started to smack one of them in the face. One of the prisoners in front of him laughed off his outburst. The man remarked that Lai Tang was a firecracker. Though he was just crying earlier he had proven to be tougher than he looked. Lai Tang is taken aback by the man's statements and wants to know who he is. Meanwhile, in the royal court, Su Yun Lan entered and immediately drew the attention of the courtiers. All eyes are on him as he made his way toward the emperor. Su Yun Lan greeted the emperor and humbly presented himself as the representative of the princess. He then proceeded to report the truth regarding the northwestern drought, speaking confidently and eloquently. But the emperor was not easily impressed. He called out his name Su Yun Lan, accusing him of presuming too much by appearing before him. The king assumed that Su Yun Lan was there to plead for mercy on behalf of his son. Su Yun Lan explained to the emperor what happened to his highness as he must have been misinformed which causes his raving. However, before Su Yun Lan could plead his case, a couple of royal officials rudely interrupted and started to mock him and reminding him that he is just a filthy commoner. The officials' behavior was appalling, and they seemed to have no respect for Su Yun Lan who is trying to do the right thing. Su Yun Lan did not back down and instead, he challenged the officials' accusations by asking what made them think that his report is fake he manages to criticize the officials' presumptuous behavior. The official was quick to deny any such intentions and begged the royal majesty to take no heed of Su Yun Lan's ravings. Su Yun Lan was far from giving up. He pointed out how the officers were trying to dictate the royal majesty's family affairs, trying to make them sound unacceptable. He also reminded them that the royal majesty had wisely led the country to prosperity, and that he would not fall victim to false words. The official was outraged, but the royal majesty intervened, noting how clever Su Yun Lan's tongue was. He silenced the official which is minister he and turned his attention to Su Yun Lan's, allowing him to speak. Su Yun Lan thanked the royal majesty. The royal majesty made a gesture for him to proceed with what he was planning to do. As Su Yun Lan continued to discuss the highness's standpoint, describing him as someone who does not speak lightly to the common people. The second prince intervened and gave an explanation of why he commended his younger brother for having such brilliant ideas during the tea gathering. He proceeded to beg for mercy on his behalf which caught the royal majesty's attention. Then Su Yun Lan spoke to the royal majesty about him. His highness discovered the cause of the drought. Thinking back to the time when he had utilized prophecies from the divine scroll, and facts from the 21st century to determine the reason for the drought. 
However, using the heavenly scroll cost him greatly. Something in him was being sucked out. His whole body was momentarily in agony. He knew he had to be careful in the future but right now he must get through it. The royal majesty then asked to hear the investigation results. He started explaining while investigating the records regarding the drought and found that water sources had dried up in large areas of the northwest and the rain had not visited them for a fortnight. Along were also buried in the records, the death toll had been highest in the western regions, indicating that the source of the drought lay in the west. However, this statement was met with skepticism from some royal officials, who started accusing him of being presumptuous and not knowing what he was saying. The official claimed to have managed farmland for dozens of years and therefore would have noticed any signs of a drought. Su Yunlan remained calm and composed as he responded to the official revealing that several months ago the agricultural reports had already indicated extraordinary decreases in grain production in that area. He pointed out that the official could not have missed such an obvious warning of an impending drought. The official was taken aback and puzzled how Su Yun Lan could know such things. Su Yun Lan continued to present his findings, stating that he had sent some demon clan underlings to investigate the canals on their territory bordering the northwest. They had found fish carcasses floating in the water. This indicates that new water had ceased to flow into the canal. Su Yun Lan summarized that this was the cause of the northwestern drought. He implored the royal majesty to send workmen to the northwest and to set his highness free. The royal officials looked at each other in shock and disbelief. Some court officials were surprised by Su Yun Lan's argument, with some even commenting on what they thought was a good-for-nothing prince. The royal majesty was impressed by Su Yun Lan's intelligence and seemed intrigued by his proposal, then ordered Minister Lai to investigate all water feeding into the demon clan's canals immediately. Overseer Han was also instructed to put Su Yun Lan's aid plan into motion forthwith. Then the royal majesty leaned forward. Su Yun Lan smiled feeling relieved that he had managed to convince the royal majesty. The royal majesty warned Su Yun Lan that his investigations should not yield the promised results. He would have his head as a consolation prize. Su Yun Lan accepted the warning and promised to deliver on his proposal. Su Yun Lan feels the tense situation in Princess Yuan Ying's estate, as he stands before her with her sword pointed at his throat. He is confused and alarmed by the sudden aggression asking if he has done anything to deserve such treatment. However, the princess seems to be unconvinced and began to cite the example of Lai Tang, who was imprisoned for speaking out of turn in court. Su Yun Lan is nervous as the princess draws a small cut on his throat, realizing that any sudden movements could be fatal. He wondered why Lai Tang's behavior is being linked to him. At this point, a maidservant interrupts their conversation, informing the princess that the Yongwei sect has sent for Mr. Su. The princess is surprised at this news and turns her attention to Su Yun Lan, who remains silent. The princess accuses him of being in league with his fiancée, Ning Yuer, to deceive her. Su Yun Lan realizes that the misunderstanding is only getting worse, and he needs to act fast. Yuan Ying is annoyed by Su Yun Lan's silence and ordered him to leave and attend to his fiancée, Ning Yuer. Su Yun Lan thinks that Princess is assuming the wrong things. However, he needs to leave and sort out the issue with Ning Yuer and the Yangwei sect. Su Yun Lan arrived at the meetup location and is suspicious of why Ning Yuer had called him there. He knew that she had an ancient cultivation art that could steal his blood and spirit energy, and according to the Heavenly Scroll, she would poison his dessert. He noticed a squirrel running up a nearby tree. Suddenly, an idea struck him and used the squirrel to reveal Yuer's true intentions. Ning Yuer arrived, and she greeted him with a smile and a flaunt of her dress. Su Yun Lan said he waited for a while. When Ning Yuer tripped on her ankle, Su Yun Lan quickly caught her before she fell to the ground. She thanked him and continued to act affectionately toward him. Su Yun Lan asked why she did call him there. However, Ning Yuer changes the subject and just taunts him with his impatience. Ning Yuer then offered him a pastry she had made and urged him to try it. Su Yun Lan was hesitant, knowing that it could be poisoned, but decided to play along. Ning Yuer noticed that he wasn't eating and tried to feed him. Su Yun Lan couldn't help but think that if he wasn't warned by the Heavenly Scroll or if he was the old Su Yun Lan, he would be dead by now. Suddenly a squirrel appeared in the room and Su Yun Lan offered a piece of pastry to the squirrel. Ning Yuer was caught off guard when Su Yun Lan did that. She became anxious and tried to retrieve the pastry from the squirrel. But Su Yun Lan stopped her and suggested that they both have a piece. Just when they were about to eat, the poor squirrel suddenly died. Su Yun Lan confirms that the pastry was indeed poisoned. So he threw the pastry and the cup away in disgust and confronted Ning Yuer, accusing her of trying to poison him. 
Ming Yur was caught in the act and couldn't deny her actions. Su Yun Lan was furious and started calling her names. He pointed out that she colluded with her lover to try to get him killed. He couldn't let his guard down around someone as deceitful as Ning Yuer. So Ning Yuer was speechless. The tension between Ning Yuer and Su Yun Lan was escalating rapidly. Ning Yuer had drawn her sword and pointed it towards Su Yun Lan, calling him an ungrateful bastard. Su Yun Lan was surprised by her outburst and asked why she was allowed to try to poison him, but he couldn't insult her. In response, Ning Yuer pulled out a drug and offered it to Su Yun Lan. She promised him untold riches and protection from the Emperor's wrath if he took the drug. Su Yun Lan countered by suggesting they take the drug together and share the wealth. However, Ning Yuer threatened to drug him by force and was about to swing her sword when she suddenly stopped. She noticed the jade tassel that Su Yun Lan was holding in his hand and realized that it belonged to the princess. She demanded an explanation, but Su Yun Lan refused to answer her questions and announced that he was going back to the princess's estate. Ning Yur was left in disbelief and called the princess a slut. She was envious of the princess and wondered what the princess had that she didn't. Ning Yur vowed to one day have her chance to ascend the heavens. After the altercation with Ning Yur, Su Yun Lan found himself focusing on other things, such as plans from the emperor. Suddenly, a cartwheeled vehicle rushed towards him, and he was dragged into a wheeled vehicle by two unknown men. Su Yun Lan initially thought that it was Ning Yur's people and asked them who they were. The men did not answer so he swung a sharp knife the intent to defend himself. Acting fast, the man opposite to him caught the blade with his fingers, telling him to cool down. Su Yun Lan was silent and looked at the old geezer. The old man said that he wasn't an enemy and had only followed orders to take him back to the court. Su Yun Lan recognized the man in front of him as Tang Baeyun, the captain of the uniformed guard and the brother of the majesty. He respectfully greeted Tang Baeyun who told him that his brother wanted to see him in the royal court. Su Yun Lan understood and responded that he appreciated the attention. As Su Yun Lan arrived at the royal palace, the guard announced his arrival. Su Yun Lan was honored to be in the royal majesty's presence as he filled his voice with respect. The royal majesty commanded Su Yun Lan to rise, telling him that there was no need for formalities. The royal majesty made a solemn announcement to the court, revealing that the cause of the drought in the northwest had been found. He proposed that the problem was in the western canals. Lai Tang expressed admiration and gratitude towards Su Yun Lan. Minister he was also impressed and agreed that it was as he said. Other officials commended the youngster for showing some potential. The royal majesty was relieved that the crisis had been averted and wanted to reward Su Yun Lan accordingly. Su Yun Lan saw this as an opportunity to escape his engagement and bravely asked for the hand of Princess Yuan Ying. The court officials were shocked at Su Yun Lan's audacity and started to mock him for his lack of wealth and status. Lai Tang admired Su Yun Lan's boldness, but the royal majesty was hesitant to let him marry Princess Yuan Ying because of his low status and asked his daughter. Princess Yuan Ying, on the other hand, looked up to her father and spoke out, reminding him of a promise he had made to her. She requested that her father must honor his promise to fulfill Su Yun Lan's request. The reaction of the court officials were shock and disbelief at the princess's decision to marry someone beneath her. Then the royal majesty silenced them all, as he was also hesitant to allow such a marriage due to the difference in rank, and all court officials nodded in agreement at what the royal majesty said. After much debate, the royal majesty relented and allowed Princess Yuan Ying to take Su Yun Lan as his fiancé. It implied that she would take him based on their respective ranks, with the person holding the higher rank typically taking the other as their spouse. Then the royal majesty dismissed the assembly. Su Yun Lan expressed his gratitude, and the court officials continued to express their disbelief. In the princess's estate, Su Yun Lan felt accomplished knowing that he had solved the issue of his engagement to Ning Yur. Su Yun Lan then met Princess Yuan Ying and Lai Tang in the room. Yuan Ying excused her brother to go as she had a matter to discuss with Mr. Su, so he asked Princess Yuan Ying what the matter would be. Princess Yuan Ying summed up their situation with the outside world and expressed gratitude to Su Yun Lan for saving her brother's life. To pay him, she accepted to marry him in front of his royal majesty. Su Yun Lan admired the close bond between the siblings. Princess Yuan Ying looked at Su Yun Lan with suspicion. She was known for her impatience towards anyone who she felt was trying to manipulate her. She didn't care how he had barged into the court with unclear intentions and warned him not to use her brother for his personal objectives. Su Yun Lan stuttered out his response, but Yuan Ying maintained her gaze on him and allowed him to proceed. However, when Su Yun Lan asked for a possible presumptuous request, Yuan Ying quickly told him not to ask. But Su Yun Lan humorously asked for her money, which left both of them silenced. 
Yun thought it was ridiculous for her fiancé to ask her for money when they were just engaged. Su Yun Lan, on the other hand, was confused by her reaction and wondered what she meant when she said he might not. Yuan Ying asked him what he wanted, and Su Yun Lan explained that he needed money to settle himself in the capital. Yuan Ying allowed him to take money from the treasury in the future but didn't want to be bothered with trivial matters. So Su Yun Lan happily walked out of the room. But Yuan Ying stared at him with frustration and thought of him as a typical commoner. Meanwhile, at the second prince's estate, Su Yun Lan was beside himself with excitement. He thought he had just been given access to the imperial treasury and was eager to spend his new wealth. Lai Tang then spotted Su Yun Lan and confusedly asked if he had walked out from there. Su Yun Lan responded humorously if he was supposed to crawl. Lai Tang's arm was placed over Su Yun Lan's shoulder and he excitedly suggested they go out and celebrate. Lai Tang also talked about an interesting guy he met in prison, which made Su Yun Lan wonder what kind of people he saw there. However, Su Yun Lan was particularly interested in the Ning family estate, where his ex fiance lived. He asked Lai Tang about the Ning family estate, so Lai Tang told him about the Ning's pawnbroker shop, which specialized in refined black iron, a rare and valuable material that he had heard about from his sister. On second thought, Lai Tang asked why Su Yun Lan was thinking about his ex fiance and if he was thinking of getting back with her. In an awkward situation, Su Yun Lan told Lai Tang that he was overthinking it and offered to go out for a drink. Su Yun Lan had an awkward face, mouthing the word pawn shop and refined black iron. He thought that the ancient world might have kept rare materials and skills secret, but a modern scientist could use them to his advantage. Su Yun Lan saw an opportunity for revenge against the Nings and decided to use the money he had borrowed from Yuan Ying to fund his venture. Lai Tang was creeped out by Su Yun Lan's cold smile. At the royal fiancé pawn shop, people discuss rumors of the princess's fiancé buying out pawnbrokers in the eastern district for a high price. Some mention the fiancé offering a high price for the low-quality yellow slurry, while another suggests selling it to the sucker who bought out the pawnbrokers. In the other scene, a shopkeeper in the pawn shop buys all the yellow slurry from the individuals, while Su Yun Lan just sits and listens to them. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan thinks to himself that the people in this era have outdated metallurgy knowledge as he recognizes the yellow slurry as chalcopyrite, a copper ore, and plans to refine it into copper and use it to make bronze based on his knowledge of modern metallurgy. He also thinks that the Nings have a monopoly on the production of black refined iron, but he will use his 21st century knowledge to make metal that is much stronger. At the Ning estate, Ning Yuer thinks he overestimated Su Yun Lan and then planned to send a gift fit for a royal wedding a dozen carts carrying tons of yellow slurry, hoping to bankrupt him. Meanwhile, at Royal Fiancé Pawn Shop, an employee informs Su Yun Lan that the Nings are making trouble, and brought a couple of dozen carts of slurry. Su Yun Lan meets Ning Yuer, who cracks a joke about the street under the weight of her carts. Ning Yuer then says that she heard that he needed a large quantity of yellow slurry, so she brought a dozen of carts. Su Yun Lan turns towards Ning Yuer and tells her that he indeed needs an amount of slurry for ore refinement, then orders his employees to transport the goods into the warehouse. The individuals around him couldn't help but gossip about his plan. They found it ridiculous and laughed at him, calling him a fool. Ning Yuer, on the other hand, sarcastically questions the quality of the armor that can be made from slurry-grade materials if it would break even if not worn. But Su Yun Lan assures her that he knows what he's doing and left her to take care of his matter. Su Yun Lan commands his staff to inform the people of the updated prices. The staff quickly makes the announcement to the town of the updated prices, causing a frenzy in the village. People rush to gather as much slurry as they can find and sell it to Su Yun Lan. Some say he was a bit crazy for buying such low-quality materials, while others saw it as an opportunity. Ning Yuer orders her four largest pawnbrokers to spread the word about Su Yun Lan's offer. She knows that by doing so, she can take advantage of the situation to make Su Yun Lan poor and ruin him, so if the princess kicks him out, he can crawl back to her like a dog. At the same time, in the smithy area, the workers inform their boss, Su Yun Lan, that they have forged an item according to his instructions and acknowledge that he has turned waste into treasure. At this moment, Lai Tang arrives to see Su Yun Lan. He is greeted by Su Yun Lan, who informs him that there is a new weapon for him to try hot off the forge. Lai Tang asked what it was, and Su Yun Lan replied by revealing it to be a dagger, which was recently forged at their workshop. 
Lai Tang seems surprised, questioning Su Yun Lan's decision to spend so much money on a dagger. As Lai Tang is inspecting the dagger, he accidentally drops it, and it falls on a ground, piercing right through it. He is amazed at how sharp the dagger is and asks Su Yun Lan how he managed to make it. Su Yun Lan reveals that he used a special process to refine the slurry he bought, creating a unique alloy that is both durable and sharp also compares it to the best weapon-making material in the world, which is claimed to be the black refined iron used by the Ning family. He even suggests that his dagger is better than anything the Ning family could make. Su Yun Lan then requests Lai Tang to take Met along to witness tomorrow's exchange between the princess and the Ning heiress. A staff member is thanking Ning Yuer for organizing the four largest pawnbrokers to monopolize the newest shipment of black refined iron, used to create unmatched armor, and he is confident that even the high and mighty princess will need to seek their stock. Ning Yuer expresses her disdain for the high and mighty princess, who she believes has only been lucky to be born into royalty. However, her smugness was short-lived as the eldest princess arrived. Ning Yuer knelt and honored her princess, but in her thought, she's plotting to sell the black refined iron armor to the princess for a high price. Princess Yuan Ying ordered them to rise and then instructed General Lai to begin the inspection of the new military equipment. As Lai Tang and Su Yun Lan entered the room, he couldn't help but boast about his dagger and shows off to General Lai and offered to test the armor's strength. He then pokes it with his dagger. To everyone's surprise, the armor was pierced with ease as well as Ning Yuer. Princess Yuan asks what's going on, and Lai Tang said that he has a dagger made by Su Yun Lan. Ning Yuer gritted her teeth and was unable to believe that the armor made of genuine black refined iron could be penetrated so easily. Su Yun Lan mocks her by revealing that even common farmers have black refined iron tools, and Ning Yuer's family should be ashamed to call themselves the number one weapons manufacturer. Ning Yuer fell to her knee unable to grasp and accused Su Yun Lan of spreading lies and slander, claiming that Ning's would never lie or cheat the crown. The princess interrupted Ning Yu's and told her to compose herself in front of the court before instructing retainer Yu to investigate to Yun Lan's claim. Yu and Ying expressed confidence that the truth will be revealed soon. Lady Ning is then cautioned by Yu and Ying to be mindful of her words. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan, who is silently observing, is amused at the support of the princess showing. Suddenly, Retainer Yu is returned and reports to Princess that her fiancé, Su, isn't wronged, and concludes that the farmers are using tools made of black refined iron. Ning Yu was left in disbelief. Retainer Yu immediately approached Princess Yu and Ying to take a closer look to confirm that the tools are indeed made of black refined iron. Princess Yuan Ying then throws the thing to Ning Yuer. Ning Yuer was in disbelief and wonders how this could be possible, suspecting that Su Yun Lan may have set her up. She then kneeled and bowed to the princess and admits her family's mistake in their inspections, showing remorse and accepting any punishment that the royal family deems. In her thought, she needs to focus on damage control and plans to make someone pay after it. But Su Yun Lan came in front of her and then mocks her for her downfall, calling her a stray mutt crawling on her last legs and commenting on her shallow beauty. Ning Yuer thinks of Su Yun Lan as a loser who now dares to act better than her and feels angry and resentful towards him. Ning Yuer watched as Su Yun Lan walks away, she felt powerless to oppose the princess, but the thought of losing to Su Yun Lan was unbearable. She just waiting for a perfect opportunity to stab him with poison. But Ning Yuer grits her teeth in frustration as to why Su Yun Lan walks back to her. Ning Yuer is caught off guard when Su Yun Lan stepped on her wrist, causing Ning Yuer to drop the poison shiv in her hand. Su Yun Lan smirked and looked at her hand, where he noticed the poison shiv, and accused Ning Yuer of plotting to stab the princess. Ning Yuer denies the accusation and claims that she only wants to kill Su Yun Lan. However, Su Yun Lan is convinced of her treachery for plotting to stab the royal fiancé which is him then orders the guards to arrest her and throw her in the royal prison for crimes against the princess's fiancé. Left furious, Ning Yuer continues to make threats and curse Su Yun Lan. She vows to one day to get her revenge. But he calls her crazy for making threats when her own life is in danger. Yu and Ying questions Su Yun Lan if it's connected to recent events about the yellow slurry he purchased. Su Yun Lan admits to using his metallurgy skills to extract black refined iron from the slurry, which he used to strengthen a dagger with tungsten and a little stronger than ordinary black iron. So Yu and Ying was amazed and knew that he was not someone to be underestimated. Su Yun Lan then surprised Yu and Ying by presenting her with a gift. Since the princess is not overly fond of cosmetic products, Yu and Ying stammered out of surprise. Prize. Su Yun Lan presents the golden regalia that he made with a material more precious than black refined iron. He presents it as his bride price and hopes that she will accept it. 
Yuan Ying was shocked at the notion of a bride price. He then humbly asks for a favor as Yuan Ying allows him to speak. Su Yunlan requests that when the northwestern drought ends and the rebuilding process begins, he wanted the princess to ask her father to grant pardons to all convicts who aid in the reconstruction efforts. Yuan Ying agrees to the request, acknowledging that the reconstruction will need manpower. On to the royal prison where Ning Yue is locked up. Her grandfather visited her and she asks for help, but his grandfather refuses as she has committed crimes related to the royal family. However, the only option his grandfather has is to give her to the emperor's younger brother, Kyan, who is known for his inappropriate behavior and she has to become his 38th concubine as a way to avoid punishment. Later, during licking Kyan's toe, Ning Yura thinks about her current situation and feels bitter about how she a prodigy has been forced to marry someone like Kyan. She then thought of seeking revenge against Su Yun Lan. In the middle of that, Kyan felt satisfied and rewarded Ning Yue with a pat then asks her to bark like a dog, to which Ning Yue responds by barking. Meanwhile, at the princess estate where Su Yun Lan and Yuan Ying's wedding is being celebrated, Princess Ying thanks everyone who has come to celebrate their wedding. Several people offer their congratulations including the second prince, the seventh prince, head chef Peng, and Prince Kyan's mistress Ning Yue. At this moment, Su Yun Lan wonders how Ning Yue was released from prison and maybe sold herself to escape in the prison and consider her a joke. The whole time, Ning Yue feels jealous of Su Yun Lan to be doing better while she's not. Afterward, a minister reads out the imperial decree which awards the princess 200 pounds of gold and a bolt of pure silk. And the majesty acknowledges Su Yun Lan's talent in resolving a drought and iron working talent, then grants him a mine on the city outskirts, 100 smithies, and appoints him as the royal armament purveyor. Su Yun Lan proudly accepts and honored the imperial decree. In contrast, Ning Yue blames Su Yun Lan for stealing everything from her and sending her to waste away in prison. Ning Yue also criticizes the princess for marrying a retainer and accuses Su Yun Lan of cowardice for leaving her and Ling Fen in the spirit realm. But Su Yun Lan brushes off Ning Yue's accusations and is confident in his favor. Others chime in, labeling Su Yun Lan a low-ranking servant who dared to cancel his engagement with Madame Ning. Just as the people had said, Lai Tang asks Su Yun Lan what they should do about this rabble, then Su Yun Lan assures him that things will work out in their favor. Amidst the commotion, a royal representative urgently reports that a group of commoners has gathered outside the estate, demanding to see Su Yun Lan. Yet, Su Yun Lan is in awe of people asking by his name. Ning Yue is pleased to see Su Yun Lan in trouble, but Yuan Ying tries to settle the situation. However, the crowd becomes increasingly unruly, demanding to see Su Yun Lan, the royal fiancé. On the princess's estate, a large group of people had gathered, demanding to see the royal fiancé. Ning Yue, observing the commotion, sarcastically suggested that Su Yun Lan must have done something wrong to cause such a stir. However, Su Yun Lan appeared confused about why the crowd had come to the estate. To his surprise, the group confirmed that he was the royal fiancé they had been searching for, and they thanked him for upgrading their farming tools, praising him as a god amongst them. Ning Yue and the others were surprised that the people were not there to complain, so Lai Tang cheered for Su Yun Lan. Suddenly, the crowd presented Su Yun Lan with a giant elephant penis, claiming that they had caught it as a gift to help him beef up his manhood. Yuan Ying noticed the farmer's comments about enhancing Su Yun Lan's masculinity, causing him to briefly feel scared. The crowd also showed gratitude to Su Yun Lan for getting rid of Ning Yue, whom they accused of overcharging them for farming tools. So Ning Yue responded to the crowd's insults with anger, while Su Yun Lan ironically remarked on her exposed attempt at crying. At that moment, Ning Yue's aggression escalated when she unsheathed her sword to attack Su Yun Lan, shouting to slaughter him like a hog. However, Su Yun Lan immediately crossed his bare hand to block the sword, and Yuan Ying was able to save him from harm. Su Yun Lan showed signs of relief by showing an affectionate response to Yuan Ying. Ning Yue, on the other hand, criticized Su Yun Lan for hiding behind a woman. But Yuan Ying was furious with Ning Yue for causing such a scene on her wedding day and dared her to act with such impudence. She then cut Ning Yue's face, telling her that her death sentence may be revoked but she would suffer for the rest of her life, punishing her by taking away what she had polished for years. Ning Yue felt incredible pain as her face was cut. The crowds were shocked by Yuan Ying's strength and talent, as the strongest of her generation. Even a decade of training couldn't save Ning Yue, since her abilities had intimidated some and she could compete with and even outperform her elders. So Kyan, who had brought Ning Yue to the wedding, felt humiliated and dragged her to his home. Su Yun Lan thought to himself that his score with the Nings was settled but there were still others who wronged him. Meanwhile, at the Demon Clan's sacred summit, the Demon Lord was congratulated on exiting seclusion. One of his demons informed him that Su Yun Lan had disobeyed his arrangement to marry into the Ning family, 
and was engaged to his adopted daughter, Princess Ying. In addition, rumors were spreading that Su Yun Lan and Princess Ying were siblings committing incest. The demon lord ordered them to bring Su Yun Lan to him. The night was deep when Kayan swept through the lavish halls of the brothel, admiring the beauty of the women. He was then approached by a woman who offered him a mask for his pleasure, and another woman who teased him to catch them. Kayan eagerly accepted the invitation and made his way to the room with the women, consumed by sexual desire. Upon removing his blindfold, he gasped and cursed upon seeing one of their faces. Later on, a royal police officer arrived on the scene after a gruesome murder. The victim was the crown's younger brother, Kayan. The officer urged everyone to stay alert and promised to find every piece of evidence. The examination of the body revealed bite marks and traces of a demonic sleeping potion. Based on the evidence, a demon committed the murder, possibly disguised as a concubine according to one police officer's speculation. They noted that the demon wasn't alive, as the estate guards weren't able to sense its life force. The police officer doubted that it could be the demon clan that entered the city yesterday. The head officer approved and instructed one of his police officers to write the piece of speculation, and prepared to submit their findings to the majesty. At the same moment, in the princess's estate, servant Yun informed Princess Yuani that her husband had been taken by his adoptive father, the Demon King. Princess Yuani was shocked and requested to be prepared to see the Demon King at once. On the other hand, Su Yun Lan, who was apparently kidnapped, confronted his captors and questioned their audacity for attacking the princess's husband on her estate. He later recognized them as members of the demon clan and revealed himself as the clan's third son, asking why he was being treated that way. The demon people accused him of breaking off his engagement and told him he knew what he had done. Su Yun Lan explained to them that it wasn't an engagement but a death sentence, as Ning Yuer had tried to kill him, and he just acted in self-defense. But they dismissed his explanation and informed him of a more significant offense they were there to address. Then they showed him a letter from the palace, revealing the emperor's brother is dead. Su Yun Lan was shocked and realized that Ning Yuer's husband was eaten by a demon. He thought to himself that this was a big deal but didn't understand what it had to do with him. The demon lord appeared, revealing that the matter was related to him. He told Su Yun Lan that he was the last remaining member of the Su clan and a descendant of the shamanic Nine Circles clan, and the victim was also his enemy. The demon lord, who was Su Yun Lan's father, accused him of daring to claim that it had nothing to do with him. But Su Yun Lan stammered as he called out to his father. On the princess's estate, Su Yun Lan greeted his father who seemed angry and resentful towards him, which made him nervous. As they spoke, Ning Yura's grandfather suddenly appeared, reminding Su Yun Lan that he signed his death warrant when he broke off his engagement with Ning Yur. So so Su Yun Lan sighed and asked if he was Ning Yu's grandfather. He thought that Ning's family was disgraced and ruined, still making trouble and determined to take revenge against the whole clan. Moreover, the grandfather accused Su Yun Lan's clan of using demonic possession to commit an attack, which made Su Yun Lan unsure if he was bluffing or not. Suddenly, Meng Qi, the right hand of the demon clan, spoke up, suggesting that the case was not yet resolved and there were loose ends. Su Yun Lan believed that his uncle Meng Qi, whom his father trusted, was supportive and might take a favorable turn. However, Yuan Ying appeared and claimed she could prove Su Yun Lan's innocence, stating that he was with her all night and had no chance to commit the murder. The demons agreed with Yuan Ying, while the demon lord appeared uninterested and thought he had evidence. Yura's grandfather, however, was not willing to let him go easily. So Su Yun Lan said to Yura's grandfather that he was a bit pushy and mocked him to be a crook from a disgraced family with a personal vendetta against him. This angered Yura's grandfather, and he gestured that he would not hesitate to attack Su Yun Lan. The demon lord intervened, stating that he was not present for the argument or the explanations. Whether Su Yun Lan was a criminal or a murderer did not concern him. He declared that if he decides to kill Su Yun Lan, it would be solely his decision. As the princess's consort, Su Yun Lan pleaded with the demon lord to spare him and called him an old man, then promised to bring the real murderer in seven days. The demons were quite surprised by Su Yun Lan's audacity and called him a reckless whelp. In the middle of that, the demon lord reminisced about the past when he was referred to as an old man. He remembered spending time with Su Yun Lan when he was a child. Young Su Yun Lan had told his dad that spending the whole afternoon fishing was just lame and even added that going to see some courtesan was a better option instead. So the demon lord scolded Su Yun Lan for suggesting visiting a courtesan and lectured him on the importance of fishing for meditation and self-cultivation. Su Yun Lan, immaturely, called him a hooligan and continued to disrespect him by calling him an old man. The demon lord requested to be addressed as dad, but Su Yun Lan persisted in calling him a little old man and laughed mischievously. Back to the present, the demon lord had made an agreement with Su Yun Lan to wait for seven days to find the real murderer. The demon lord promised to take the murderer's life as compensation, which Su Yun Lan accepted. To ensure Su Yun Lan's safety during this time, the demon lord instructed He Yan, the grand supervisor of the demon clan, 
to protect him. Yi Yan agreed and promised not to fail the demon lord. Su Yun Lan believed that Yi Yan was his childhood friend from a past life, making it easier to work with someone familiar. In the palace, where Yu and Ying and Su Yun Lan were having a conversation, they confirmed that he was the last descendant of the Nine Circles clan. Su Yun Lan explained that his ancestry had made him a target for the Nings. Yu and Ying expressed concern about uncovering the murderer in seven days and asked for a plan. Su Yun Lan reassured Yuan Ying that he planned to take matters into his own hands to eliminate his enemies and the root of the problem. He believed that revenge could not wait and he must act swiftly. At the capital outskirts Demon Cliffs, He Yan and Su Yun Lan were hiding from the zombie demons. He Yan asked Su Yun Lan about his plan, and Su Yun Lan told him to hide while he handled the situation. He Yan was surprised when Su Yun Lan grabbed his butt and told him not to be weird. So Su Yun Lan apologized, saying that his hand had slipped but his thoughts revealed that he Yan was his cherished companion from a past life. While standing on the cliff, as the leaves fell in the wind, Su Yun Lan took charge and began his investigation from within. He then used the Nine Circles ultimate technique to possess a zombie demon in the capital outskirts. Having successfully possessed the zombie demon, Su Yun Lan interrogated them to uncover any manipulation over the past month. The scene shifted to official Mao's residence. The sound of wind and dry leaves swept across the mountains, setting the scene for the events that were about to unfold. Su Yun Lan had been possessed by zombie demons, and he was expressing frustration because no one remembered the murder that had occurred. He began to question whether a demon was even responsible, despite accusations from the Nings. As they made their way back to the princess's estate, Su Yun Lan apologized for overusing his possession technique and feeling loopy, so Yi Yan suggested taking him to see the princess. On the way, they encountered Yuan Ying, whom Su Yun Lan greeted warmly, pleased to see her waiting for him. However, Yuan Ying gave him an annoyed look because she was distracted by Su Yun Lan and He Yan's affectionate behavior. So she clarified that it was just a morning walk and left them both. Su Yun Lan grew concerned by her reaction and tried to stop the princess, asking her if she was jealous. This caused Yuan Ying to deny it grumpily and accuse him of being jealous. Su Yun Lan showed a poker face but still proceeded to explain that he and He Yan were not in a romantic relationship and joked about saying no homo. He then pointed out the male restroom where He Yan was and said that he might look like a quiet maiden but he carried a big stick. Yuan Ying was surprised, but Su Yun Lan assured her that she was the only woman in his heart. So Yuan Ying blushed as she understood. Yuan Ying nearly forgot to tell Su Yun Lan something important, piquing his curiosity. Meanwhile, rumors were spreading at the inn that another relative of the crown had been found dead, and the perpetrator was a member of the Nine Circle clan. There were also rumors that the princess was the mastermind behind the killings and was making her husband Su Yun Lan do the dirty work. Yuan Ying, on the other hand, informed Su Yun Lan that another uncle of hers was killed by a demon while he was out investigating, and rumors were rampant throughout the city. Su Yun Lan expressed frustration with the commoners gossiping all day. Yuan Ying assured him that there was no use getting angry at them and that she believed in Su Yun Lan's innocence. She offered to lend her personal army to Su Yun Lan to help with the investigation. So Su Yun Lan showed relief, thanking her for her love, and declared that it was up to the two of them to root out the villain behind the scenes. In the princess's estate, He Yan confronted Su Yun Lan about why he went to town to buy breakfast and handed out tools to the farmers. He scolded Su Yun Lan for taking the princess's personal army with him, thinking that it was a waste of time. However, Su Yun Lan brushes it off by offering He Yan some drunken pavilion drumsticks, which He Yan loves and thanks him for. He Yan is surprised when Su Yun Lan knows he loves the drumsticks and gives him a seductive look. But Su Yun Lan jokes by showing his middle finger and telling him not to do that. Yi Yan laughs and remarks that Su Yun Lan's reaction is just like her old best friend's. So Su Yun Lan thinks to himself that he is He Yan's old best friend, even though he is in a different body now. Su Yun Lan tells He Yan that they need to go to an Legong's estate in two days, but He Yan asks why, as Su Yun Lan's investigation deadline will be up by then. But Su Yun Lan assures him that he will understand once they get there. Two days later, they arrive at Enlegong's estate, where Enlegong, the emperor's younger cousin, greets them. Su Yun Lan respectfully tells him that they have good news. However, Enlegong diverts his attention to He Yan's beauty and makes a lewd remark, which angers He Yan. But Su Yun Lan explains that he is 100% man. So Enlegong invites them inside but is surprised by the sudden arrival of strangers who jump over his fence, causing him to tremble. Su Yun Lan calmly faces the corpses, as he had expected their arrival, and sarcastically introduces them to Enlegong as their company for the night. So Enlegong rushes out to the area. He Yan asks Su Yun Lan how he knew that they would attack Enlegong's place tonight. Su Yun Lan reveals that two days ago, he had the princess's personal army working with farmers to gather intel, which showed some unusual movement at Enlegong's estate. 
They also discovered that Grandpa Ning had visited the estate, and he just pretended to be out buying breakfast to make a connection with an Legong and secure an invitation to his estate. Su Yunlan says that they are there today and everything has played out as he expected. Ning Grandpa suddenly appears and Su Yunlan announces that they have come to catch the mastermind. Ning Grandpa praises Su Yunlan for having good calculations, instantly ordering his puppet corpse to attack Su Yunlan and He Yan. So Su Yunlan tells He Yan to take care of his body, then collapses onto He Yan's shoulder in a fast-paced situation. As the puppet corpses attack both He Yan and Su Yunlan's bodies, demons suddenly appear and fight them off, leaving He Yan surprised. When Su Yunlan reveals that he had the troops pretend to be farmers and sneak demons into the city, Ning Grandpa gets fearful and grits his teeth. Su Yunlan then shows his demon general form and smirks. Grandpa Ning shivers and grits his teeth in fear when Su Yunlan is behind his back in demon form. He explains that he had the troops pretend to be farmers to sneak some demons into the city and hide them at an Legong's estate, just waiting to catch him today. Su Yunlan smirks. He then appeared in front of Grandpa Ning in the form of a demon general, causing him to feel terrified of Su Yunlan's presence. Grandpa Ning remarked that Su Yunlan could really possess demons. In response to this, Grandpa Ning challenged Su Yunlan, asking if his demons were a match for his puppets. But Su Yunlan simply smirked and confidently accepted the challenge daring Grandpa Ning to bring it on. After the challenge was accepted, Grandpa Ning diverted the attack toward He Yan and Su Yun Lan. In response, Su Yun Lan released his reserve demon troops from near his body. He then revealed to Grandpa Ning that he had reserve troops and called him out for underestimating him. So Grandpa Ning revealed an ace up his sleeve and ordered the puppet army to ignite themselves in the second ignition phase, causing them to self-explode and dive toward their targets. He Yan was surprised by the explosion and the puppet's attack. He felt the heat from the puppet as it almost punched him. However, Su Yun Lan stopped it, warning them to pick on someone closer to their size and know their place. The puppet growled, but Su Yun Lan kicked its chin, remarking that the bigger the bark, the weaker the bite. Su Yun Lan added that they were all just flesh and no soul. Despite his warning, the puppet still set itself on fire and rushed towards Su Yun Lan for a punch. However, Su Yun Lan easily sidestepped and countered the puppet's attack, saying it was his turn. He smacks the puppet's face and it crashes to the floor. Now, he forms his fist with fire and delivers a powerful punch to the puppet's face. However, he is also exhausted. He mutters to himself that he may have overestimated the puppet, that it was all bluff and bluster. Looking at his hand, now covered in blood, he wonders why it is bleeding. Just then, he notices Grandpa Ning's quick escape and commends him for his swift move. Meanwhile, Grandpa Ning assures himself that the ultimate technique requires a lot of stamina, and Su Yun Lan shouldn't be able to catch him. As Grandpa Ning flees, a woman puppet begs him not to leave her behind and pleads for an antidote. Suddenly, all the puppets explode, filling the air with the sound of their dying growls. Su Yun Lan cannot believe that they are capable of blowing themselves up. Right after, he feels something splitting apart from his head. It was the energy he used during the clash, and he disengages from the demon general form. Still in an Legong estate, He Yan wakes up Su Yun Lan, so he asks how long he was out. He Yan responds that it was probably a quarter of an hour. Su Yun Lan asks He Yan about the corpses, and He Yan explains that he thinks they were drug driven by an apathy drug that affects all types of unique corpse related cultivation. So Su Yun Lan is disgusted by the technique of turning living people into puppets. They find a tassel on the floor from the Ning family, whose clanmates were turned into puppets by old man Yuanju. Su Yun Lan orders He Yan to preserve the living dead and take them to the demon clan, which he does. The morning comes, and Su Yun Lan seems rather pleased with himself and both boasts about his heroic act yesterday. However, it seems that his boastful attitude does not impress Yuan Ying, and she simply huffs with crossed arms. Su Yun Lan wants Yuan Ying to believe him and asks He Yan to confirm his story, but He Yan is unimpressed and hands him a letter to read. Suddenly, Su Yun Lan's expression changes dramatically upon reading the letter, which reveals the news of Ning Yuanju dying from an illness. Thanks for watching. If you want the next part, please comment the word demon.